Hello, welcome to APP to APP Virtual Lectures. We have two viewer audiences this evening, My Catholic Doctor and APP to APP. My name is Sharon Best, I'm a physician assistant and I have specialized training in something called NAPRO technology. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is today. Up until about one month ago, I was working in a small private practice, OBGYN office, just outside of Philadelphia, practicing general gynecology and NAPRO technology. Um, beginning in November of 2023, I decided to practice exclusively NAPRO technology through My Catholic Doctor. My Catholic Doctor is a national healthcare organization where providers from 49 states see patients from infancy to elderly, uh, mostly telehealth, but also in-person visits. Uh, and they do offer, we have experts who offer medical services in pretty much every specialty. My presentation today is on functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, or FHA for short. I'll discuss the NAPRO diagnostic workup and evaluation, and I'll compare that to what you might find in a mainstream medicine gynecological office. I'll also present two very different clinical case studies, and I hope that you'll find them both educational and interesting. I have no disclosures, but I do have the typical disclaimer for all APP to APP lectures. This lecture is specifically for educational purposes, and we're not giving you advice on how to treat your specific individual patients. Objectives. I always like to start with important definitions, and I'll give you the definition of functional hypothalamic amenorrhea according to the Endocrine Society. We'll talk about pathophysiology, epidemiology, etiology, risk factors, and the female athlete triad, which is really just another name for FHA, just better recognized among the athletic community. Of course, we'll do the diagnostic workup and management, and I'll do the two case presentations. This is a website that I created for educational purposes. Everything I'm teaching you today is on this website as well. Um, it's called Queen of Hearts Fertility Care and Napro Technology. I created it to help empower my patients so they understand what we're doing in the Napro workup. It can be very intense and sometimes a little bit confusing. I also created the website to help new NAPRO providers uh, understand a little bit more about how we practice. Important definitions. Menarche means the first menses. So this is the first period that a woman will ever have. Adrenarche technically means awakening of the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are small organs that sit on top of the kidneys. Among other functions, they are responsible for synthesizing and secreting steroid sex hormones. Many of them we collectively know as androgens. The three that we'll be most interested in for this lecture are testosterone, DHEAS, and androstenedione. The androgens are responsible for the development of adult-like pubic hair, adult sweat glands maturation causing the body odor, and sebaceous oil gland maturation, which can present with acne or oily hair. Now, premature adrenarche per se is when adrenarche occurs in a child less than eight years of age, eight years for the female and nine years for the male. Amenorrhea is the absence of menses or the absence of the menstrual period. This can be transient, intermittent, or permanent. We can divide this into primary amenorrhea and secondary amenorrhea, primary meaning the absence of menarche by age 15, secondary meaning the absence of a menstrual cycle for greater than three months in a woman who has prior had her period. Oligoamenorrhea, oligo means slight or scant. So this definition is given when a woman is having cycles that are very long, greater than 35 days in length, or she's having less than nine menstrual cycles in a year when you would expect someone to menstruate monthly having 12. Anovulation means she's not ovulating at all, Oligoovulation means she's ovulating, but not in an ordinary cyclic monthly fashion. Now we can't talk about FHA without talking about eating disorders and disordered eating. I'm going to go through the pathophysiology on the next slide, but in a nutshell, FHA is when the body recognizes that the caloric intake that it, that it is receiving via food is less than is necessary for the caloric expenditure it needs. An eating disorder by definition of the DSM-5 is a persistent disturbance of eating behavior that impairs physical health or psychosocial functioning. 
We all are familiar with anorexia nervosa and probably bulimia. So how is disordered eating different from an eating disorder? According to the National Eating Disorder Association, an eating disorder is differentiated unless the patient has less severe obsessive thoughts and or behaviors centered on eating and or they have a lower level of functional interference. So we can think of this as a continuum from normal healthy ordered eating, disordered eating to an overt eating disorder. We also have to talk about osteopenia and osteoporosis when we talk about FHA. We're all familiar that when a woman stops menstruating around perimenopause, she'll have a low estrogenic state. And that low estrogen causes her bones to break down at a faster rate than they're building themselves up, which results in a compromised bone density that we call osteopenia or osteoporosis. By definition, osteopenia is a DEXA T score between negative 1 and negative 2.5. Osteoporosis is defined as a T score of negative 2.5 or more negative. Or we can also give this diagnosis if the woman has a presence of what we call a fragility fracture, which is a fracture that is sustained with relatively minor trauma that you wouldn't think would be enough to break the bone. We can also give osteoporosis diagnosis now based upon something called a FRAX score, which is the calculated fracture risk for a woman for 10 years. Now these T-scores are only going to apply to a perimenopausal or menopausal woman. When looking for osteopenia or osteoporosis in a younger woman, say a teen or a young adult, we have to use something called the Z-scores when we do a TEXA scan. By definition, a Z-score of less than negative 2.0 is going to qualify for the diagnosis of osteoporosis. Now define functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. According to the Endocrine Society Clinical Practice Guidelines for FHA, FHA is a form of chronic anovulation, not due to an identifiable organic cause, but rather associated with stress, weight loss, excessive exercise, or a combination thereof. So very important is that FHA is a clinical diagnosis of exclusion. So by clinical, most of us know that this means that we're going to base this diagnosis on the woman's medical history. So it's very important because medicine is so fast now. If you're seeing a patient every 15 or 20 minutes, you're going to have a high propensity to miss this diagnosis because it's going to be based on her story. It's also a diagnosis of exclusion, which means that we have to rule out any of the other causes that could possibly be causing amenorrhea, such as structural or organic causes. Most FHA experts agree that FHA is the most common cause of secondary amenorrhea, responsible for about 25 to 35% of the cases. However, it's only responsible for about 3% of primary amenorrhea. So here's the pathophysiology of FHA. What you're looking at here, this picture, is called the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. These are the structures that are involved in the menstrual cycle. Everything you see me outlining here is in the brain. So I'm gonna give you a normal physiology of the menstrual cycle first. So beginning at puberty, the woman's hypothalamus, which is an area just above the midbrain, is going to start to secrete something called gonadotropin releasing hormone. This hormone is released in a pulsatile or pump fashion. Gonadotropin releasing hormone will go directly to the pituitary gland and it will cause the pituitary to secrete another hormone called follicle stimulating hormone. Follicle stimulating hormone is going to do what its name says it's doing. It's going to stimulate the growth of a follicle. A follicle is a fluid filled sac that is growing around the egg in the ovary to help mature it. So women are born with all the ovaries, all the eggs they're ever going to have in their ovaries. Starting at puberty, they begin to mature a few of these eggs each month. One of the eggs usually wins out and becomes what we call a dominant follicle. And if everything goes well, the egg will pop out of the follicle, the follicle itself will change in structure and function and become a corpus luteum. Now the growing follicle primarily secretes estrogen. Estrogen will go to two places for the purpose of this lecture that are important. One is called the endometrium. This is the inner lining of the uterus, which is what is shed for when a woman has her period. The estrogen will cause this lining to get thicker and thicker. Estrogen will also target what we call the cervix, which is the lowest portion of the uterus, 
and cause the formation of cervical mucus. So we generally will have the woman chart with a system called the Crichton model system of charting, and we'll have her chart her bleeding patterns as well as her cervical mucus patterns. And we will look for a mucus buildup that will represent this follicle growing and developing. We expect to see mucus that changes in consistency and quantity. So we expect it to go from a small amount to a large amount of mucus and to become very clear and um, lubricative. And then all of a sudden that mucus will change. That change occurs when the egg pops out and the structure becomes a corpus luteum. The corpus luteum will primarily secrete progesterone. Progesterone will go to the lining of this uterus. It will make it secretory, which means it will have more glands that will be secreted in case a new baby is formed and embeds in that uterine wall. It will also stabilize it so it will stop growing thicker and thicker. Progesterone will also target the cervix and it will dry up that very fertile mucus and the woman will have a mucus that is more infertile. Now in FHA, what happens is again, the brain will recognize that the body is receiving less caloric intake with food. Um, it's receiving less than it requires for to maintain its energy. So perhaps the woman is exercising excessively so she needs a lot of energy and she's not getting enough to do that. Perhaps the woman has an eating disorder and she's not taking in enough calories. Perhaps the woman, even just out of significant severe stress and anxiety, this gonadotropin releasing hormone pump can be interfered with. Most experts believe that FHA is called by an interruption in the gonadotropin releasing pump. Hence the name hypothalamic functional amenorrhea tells you where the problem is originating, usually at the hypothalamus. So this will inevitably result in a downstream effect where the woman may completely turn off her menstrual cycle or she may have what we call oligomenorrhea. She'll be having some cycles. Some women that are athletes, their cycles may turn off in the season that they're involved in their sports and it may turn back on. Others may stay off for the entire year. So risk factors, obviously the female athlete, because she may be expending more energy in, in her athletics and she is taking in with her food. The past medical history of an eating disorder should, should always be discerned in these women. Women with eating disorders could actually uh, cause the FHA themselves, just the eating disorder. Also, again, the higher achiever, perfectionist personality and an emotionality are also things that we wanna look for because these are all risk factors. A woman that is just a higher achiever and very anxious and stressed can actually interfere with that gonadotropin releasing pump. Now the female athlete triad, again, it is the same thing as FHA. This is just a term that's better recognized by high school and collegiate athletes. So we have three portions of this triad, energy availability, menstrual function, and bone density. So energy availability, again, she can have normal eating off season of her sport, then she can inadvertently under eat, or maybe she has a disordered eating or a, a full overeating disorder. Menstrual function, she may menstruate off normally during her off seasons, then she may have an oligo or amenorrhea during the season, or she may have a complete oligo amenorrhea for the entire year. And then we already discussed how bone density is involved. Now, remember, FHA is a diagnosis of exclusion, so we have to exclude the other organic and structural causes. So we can think of this from top to bottom. What can be the problem at the hypothalamic level? Perhaps a brain injury, obviously tumors. We have inflammatory diseases that can infiltrate the brain, such as sarcoidosis. At the level of the pituitary, we've all seen pituitary secreting tumors. Prolactin secreting tumors are very commonly seen in gynecology. We can, the pituitary can secrete, have tumors that secrete other types of hormones. We can also have an infarction. We have Sheehan syndrome for women who have lost a lot of blood during a delivery and the pituitary was not adequately fed. We have an empty cell syndrome, which is really usually from a CSF leak where that leak is just pushing on the pituitary and it appears that it's not there in an MRI. Now at the level of the adrenals, we can have adrenal hyperplasia, we can have an androgen secreting tumor, and we have to always look for Cushing syndrome. At the level of the uterus tubes and vagina, 
You can have Mueller and Duck anomalies. I have them pictured here for you, and I talk a little bit more about these during the infertility lecture that you can access on my website. So the Mueller and Duck anomalies are more a cause of uh, amenorrhea, considered a structural cause of primary amenorrhea that we need to look for. Asherman syndrome is when the woman has excessive adhesions within the uterus. We can also have a um, abnormal growth that has not come to full maturity with the uterus or the cervix. And an imperforate hymen means the hymen does not have that typical opening and the woman will not be able to, the blood will not be able to come out the vagina. And then the level of the ovaries, we always want to think of PCOS, also premature ovarian insufficiency, which is another name for early menopause. Ovarian tumors, uh, has the patient had chemo or irradiation, and of course, some genetic disorders with Turner syndrome being the more common. Epidemiology and etiology. We have, uh, again, FHA is the most common cause of secondary amenorrhea in adolescents and young adults. Ron Deller did a study of 262 women with six months of amenorrhea who had previously had at least six menstrual cycles. The average age was 26.4, and the results indicated the following etiology of secondary amenorrhea, FHA at 33.5%, PCOS at 28%, hyperprolactinemia at 14%, and ovarian failure at 12%. And then contrast that to the most common etiologies of primary amenorrhea were actually gonadal or ovaries dysgenesis, so the ovaries did not form and mature properly. Turner syndrome was the most prevalent cause of that at 43%, and those Mullerian anomalies that we mentioned, 15%, and a physiological delay of puberty at 14%, and you can look at the others that were less. So what's the diagnostic workup? So again, medical history is paramount. So please spend some time with your patients and have some time to listen to them. Be very specific when you're asking your questions and you can consider using some san standardized screening tools. Okay, so talk about menstrual irregularities. This is the primary amenorrhea or secondary amenorrhea. Do they fit the criteria for oligomenorrhea? Are the cycles greater than 35 days or are they having less than nine menstrual cycles a year? Ask them specifically, what is their diet? What are they eating for breakfast, for lunch and dinner? What type of exercise are they doing? Exactly what are they doing and how often are they doing it? And then the two standardized screening tools that I use are the scoff screen and the E26. The scoff screen is very highly sensitive. You are not going to miss an eating disorder with that. It takes about, it's five questions and takes about 30 seconds. When this is positive, or if, it, if I still feel that there's a good indication the patient may have an eating disorder, I might ask them to complete the E26. We usually have them take that home. I tell them to go into a room by themselves, especially if it's a young patient with their mother. I ask them to really answer those questions alone and let them be completely 100% their own answers. We always talk about stress. What's your occupation? If you're a student, what is, what is your major? Uh, also, psychological, um, do you feel you have anxiety or depression? Standardized screening tools for both are GAD7 for anxiety. You can use a MedCalc online, or I have a PDF questionnaire on my website, and then a PHQ9 for depression. Both are very accurate and efficient. And again, you can find them here on the patient handout page. Here's a scoff screen. The acronym stands for sick, control, one, fat, and food. So do you make yourself sick because you feel uncomfortably full? Have you lost control over how much you eat? Have you recently lost more than one stone? Do you believe yourself to be fat when others feel, you're, when others feel that you're too thin? And do you think food dominates your life? These are yes or no answers, and two yes is a positive screen. This is a study done by Morgan et al. And you can see that out of 116 cases of eating disorders, the scoff screen picked up 116. 100% of bulimia, anorexia, binging disorder, and restricting disorder. It did have 12 positive responses that were normal controls. So the sensitivity is excellent at 100% and the specificity may be about 88%. So it's a great screening tooling, a great um, screening tool to use. So here's the diagnostic workup. We have NAPRO technology taken from Dr. Thomas Hilger's 
uh, book, which we all receive when we receive our training. And the mainstream medicine guidelines I have here or diagnostic workup I have here are taken from the FHA Endocrine Society Clinical Practice Guidelines. So we both do a beta HCG to rule out pregnancy. We both do reproductive labs, the same, FSA, LH, estradiol, and AMH when indicated. We both do prolactin. We both do 17 OHP. A little bit of a difference is that we will do uh, 17 OHP always. We pretty much screen all of our women. And the guidelines recommend that this is only done if you suspect a late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And sometimes you might be surprised. Um, so that's why we do the screening. Now the health labs, they do a CM CBC at CMP and they do an ESR and CRP when appropriate. We will do a CBC at CMP, uh, 25 OHD. So I'm always looking for vitamin D. I think it's excellent for optimizing reproductive health. It's also excellent for other body systems such as cardiovascular and renal. I do a lipid profile, which is very important. Many of our FHA patients are eating so little that they, have, they do not have a proper amount of cholesterol. And cholesterol is a precursor needed for the synthesis of the progesterone and uh, estradiol that we need. So we have to check lipids. We do a deep dive for glucose and insulin three specimen testing. I do this oftentimes to pick up high insulin because that can interfere with fertility. And it's also often found and can be easily treated for PCOS patients. I found that my FHA patients often have very low insulin levels, and that makes sense because they're eating very little. We both do thyroid function testing. Ours is a little bit deeper than the mainstream med. They do a TSH and a free T4. We'll do also a total T3 and some antibodies to the thyroid. Um, many NAPRO providers do a reverse T3, and they look for a T3 to reverse T3 ratio. Personally, I don't like doing that because I know the reverse T3 has a half-life of about 30 minutes, so it's very transient. It would probably be different at the end of the day than it is in the beginning of the day, and it's going to be very different in women depending on their stress level that particular day. And when we find all of these other labs are in perfect, perfectly normal, and the only thing that's abnormal is they have a high reverse T3, so an abnormal uh, T3 reverse T3 ratio, I think we almost can do more harm than good to our women to tell them they have a thyroid dysfunction when everything is really functioning quite well. And the treatment for the high reverse T3 is to decrease stress. So I'd rather decrease stress in all my patients. Androgen profile. The guidelines recommend doing a total testosterone and DHEAS in patients with, quote, clinical hyperandrogenism. So we know that PCOS can be diagnosed with either clinical hyperandrogenism or biochemical hyperandrogenism. And I have seen many patients with high androgens in their blood, but no clinical hyperandrogenism. So no signs or symptoms showing that. And I've seen it also in the reverse. So I think you will miss some PCOS, case, PCOS cases if you don't test the androgens. Now we do a follow-up visit after two months of charting with a Crichton model system. And then we pull full hormone panels. We have two types. One is a post-ovulatory panel to pick up luteal phase deficiencies, which is essentially low progesterone in the post-ovulatory phase. We find this in many of our patients. It can cause infertility, recurrent pregnancy losses. When we adjust this progesterone, we can treat PMS symptoms exceptionally well, and we can increase fertility. So we do check for progesterone and estradiol levels, and we time them to the Crichton model chart. We check them on what we call peak plus three, five, seven, nine, and 11. So we do five draws of estrogen and, est or excuse me, a progesterone and estradiol. And then we check therapeutic levels when we have them on the progesterone replacement, either a P plus seven, if they have a luteal phase deficiency one or two, or we might wanna do a P plus seven and a nine, they have a luteal phase deficiency type three. We can also do something called periovulatory panels, which are looking at estradiol building up to the ovulation. So that's going to be reflective of that follicle that's forming. We do that more so for patients that we're trying to get pregnant. Okay, so di diagnostic imaging, 
both uh, the FHA guidelines and NAPRO pretty much are on the same page. NAPRO does a pelvic ultrasound. We time it on cycle day five. Mainstream medicine doesn't always specify that because we want to look at the ovaries when they're quiet or in a quiescent state. We also want to look at the thickness of the endometrium very early in the cycle. So according to NAPRO, we think pretty much when the endometrium is greater than seven millimeters at cycle day five, it's probably thicker than it should be. And that could represent something, a pathology that we want to investigate further. According to the FHA guidelines, they say that the primary reason for their abdominal or transvaginal ultrasound is to look for the Mueller and Duck anomalies and or perhaps we want an MRI to confirm or rule that out. And we agree in that problem. So a DEXA scan. Again, we have to rule out early osteopenia or osteoporosis on some of our patients due to that chronic low estrogenic state. According to the guidelines, the DEXA is recommended for women who have had a six-month history of amenorrhea, uh, or perhaps they have a suspicion or a history of a severe nutritional deficiency, like an eating disorder, or other types of energy deficient states. Um, say someone has had a, a fragile fracture, so we know that they were in a car accident and they fractured multiple bones. We don't know why that happened when the impact wasn't so significant. Now the MRI of the brain is, is done to rule out a pituitary tumor. So your pituitary, a normal pituitary is only about 12 millimeters in the coronal diameter, eight in the AP anterior posterior diameter and nine millimeters high. So most MRIs are done at five millimeter cuts. So generally when I order an MRI, I dedicate it to the pituitary and I also suggest one millimeter cuts to the radiologist and hopefully they're willing to do that for you. Otherwise, I think you could miss an adenoma in the pituitary. According to the FHA guidelines, MRI is recommended really when the patient has symptoms. So they say severe persistent headache or persistent vomiting or change in vision. So they're looking at the uh, pituitary enlarging and pressing on the optic chiasm or taking up intracranial space. And that's why they have that vomiting mostly in the early morning or nighttime when they're laying flat. Um, also, they suggest that if the patient has lateralizing neurological signs or clinical signs or laboratory results that suggest pituitary hormone deficiency or excess in those hormones. Now, the pelvic ultrasound, again, done on cycle day five when ovaries are quiet. I gave you a little clinical pearl here of how we measure the full volume of the ovaries. It's not always given to you in the report. And we do look to meet the criteria that is uh, per the PCOS International Guidelines, the Rotterdam criteria, to look for PCOS ovarian morphology. I have noticed that um, a good number of FHA patients seem to have a concomitant PCOS, or at least it seems to be emerging once we get their cycles to start again. Now, in order to meet criteria, there's three criteria per PCOS, and I have a whole lecture on that also on the website. But... One of the criteria is PCOS ovarian morphology. So we'd have to have at least one ovary that's greater than 10 mils or has more than 20 subcentimeter follicles. So here's how you measure that. You're typically given three dimensions on the, on the ultrasound report. You take the sum of those three dimensions, you multiply them by each other, and then you multiply that sum by 0 0.52. And you're doing that because you're getting cubic centimeters. So you're really getting a volume of a cube. And if you look at the ovary, it's ellipsoid shape. So you have to multiply it by the 0 0.52 to take care of the additional space here and get the actual volume of the ovary. So patient A has a left and a right ovary that are normal size. Patient B has a right and left ovary that are big. So she would meet criteria for PCOS ovarian morphology. We also have another special type of ultrasound that's different called the follicular ultrasound series where we do something called follicle tracking. We do this for our infertility patients. Follicle tracking is done in mainstream medicine. It's done a little bit differently. Um, what we do is we'll start doing the ultrasound for the patient a few days after the end of her menstrual cycle. So if the initial ultrasound, she has no follicles that are greater than one centimeters, we'll repeat that in three days. Once she hits where she has a dominant follicle that's between one and 1 1.3, we'll do that ultrasound every other day. Once her dominant follicle reaches the size of 1.4 centimeters, we will then do that ultrasound every day. 
and we will do it until we see the follicle rupture or the egg. Uh, we don't see the egg coming out, but we will see that the follicle will change from smooth round borders to irregular borders and be smaller in size. So we know that the egg is ruptured. And we watch for that. Um, we watch for the corpus luteum to become luteinized or hemorrhagic. And we can identify six different ovulatory disorders and we have ways that we can treat them in the NEPRO protocols. Now, how do we treat FHA? Well, I love to treat FHA because it's about the easiest treatment in the world, which is lifestyle changes, is the first line treatment. So we ask the woman to eat more and we ask her to increase her healthy fats and cholesterol. We ask her to exercise less and then we also ask her to consider some type of mental health therapy. I always love cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, after six to nine months, if lifestyle changes does not bring back her period, then we can do some pharmacotherapy. So we'll have to give her some estradiol and some progesterone, mainly to protect her bones from osteoporosis. So lifestyle changes. I do recommend, um, I always refer my patients to a nutritionist. I have a few that work closely with me that specialize in FHA. I ask the patient to increase their caloric intake to 2,500 calories a day. That's extremely hard for a young woman to eat. And I ask them to decrease their caloric expenditure or decrease their exercise. I look at what they're doing at baseline and I see if we should be decreasing that. Again, we talk about healthy fats and cholesterol, which is needed to synthesize the estradiol and progesterone. We talk about adequate calcium and vitamin D in order for bone health. And this link will click you right into a vitamin D page on my website. I have lots of research that talks about using vitamin K. Some of the research says that this helps to decrease um, intravascular calcification and other research says it doesn't. The research has been done for over 30 years, but interestingly, every study that I have found, which is many, have enrolled only elderly, for people that have had comorbid conditions such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, osteoporosis. I've not found one study for a young woman. So I don't think there's any point in giving a young woman vitamin K2. I don't think she needs it. So I know a lot of doctors do this and I would encourage anyone if you see any studies that are in young women that show efficacy, I would love to take a look at them and put them on my website as well. So cognitive behavioral therapy is my favorite type of psychological support. It has wonderful data to support efficacy. Uh, generally speaking, it teaches the woman to recognize her thoughts. Supposedly, we each have about 50,000 thoughts a day. We learn to recognize the positive thoughts that lead to good behavior, and we learn to reject the negative thoughts that lead to deleterious behavior. I usually refer my patients to this website called catholictherapist.com. They can put their zip code in and find many therapists in their area. This person is Joni Benz. She specializes in CBT. And with her permission, I put her um, image here on this lecture. And the reason I did that is because I had multiple patients giving me feedback about Joni, that she was amazing. She, she's turned around their lives. I really turned the corner. So I kept getting this amazing feedback. So I do promote her on my Queen of Hearts website, and I'm going to give her a little shout out here as well. Now, management or pharmacotherapy. So if we work with a patient for six or nine months with lifestyle changes, cognitive behavioral therapy, and we're not resetting that HPO axis, we really should start some pharmacotherapy. We basically are giving the patient the exact same hormones that she would typically make if her menstrual cycle was activated. So we give her estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen is given typically in the form of a trans transdermal estradiol patch. This is a bioidentical type of estradiol, so it will have the least risk of um, thrombogenesis. I generally will start with a 0 0.25 to 0, 0.0 or 0 0.025 to 0 0.05 milligram patch. Generally, um, we're not going to get a good bleed unless we're up at this area. But with a very young patient that there's a lot of anxiety or concern, I might start with something lower. The patient wears the patch continuously every day. She changes it two times a week, just per the directions. And then once a month, she'll take 10 days of progesterone simulating a normal menstrual cycle. We also give bioidentical progesterone. So an easy way to help her remember is the patches come in eight patches per box. 
It's enough for four weeks, two each week. Every time she opens a new box, she can take 10 days of progesterone. So I also ask the patients to start charting with the Creighton model system. And then we check what we call P plus sevens. So the woman will have a withdrawal bleed. So when she takes her progesterone here for 10 days, after the last dose, she should have a bleed in about five to seven days. We have her document that bleeding pattern in a very specific way using the Creighton model bleeding key. And then oftentimes she'll have dry cycles, but there is some theory that there may be a downstream effect that after using these hormones, you may be able to trigger an ovulation, but most of the time I don't think you do. And I don't think we have a lot of data that will do that. But if by chance the woman begins to have a mucus buildup, she'll chart that according to the Creighton model system. But each month she'll be taking progesterone and estradiol. So the first day she takes her progesterone, if she did ovulate, we always start progesterone replacement on P plus three. So she'll count that as her simulated P plus three. And then four days later, four, five, six, seven, this is the morning that she will check her progesterone level. And then we'll match those to norms of what we call a P plus seven. So the norms were created by the St. Paul VI Institute where NAPRO technology was invented. And we have 30 years of research of what those norms would be on those particular days in the, in the luteal phase. It's really important to check that progesterone the first at least one or two times. I have had colleagues tell me about some rare cases where they have used this pharmacotherapy. And for some odd reason, the woman did not um, metabolize the progesterone. So she was just getting a buildup of estradiol until her endometrium became so thick that it induced a very dangerous abnormal uterine bleeding. So do check your progesterone when you're going to start that therapy. So now we're to our clinical cases. So our first case is, is rather simple. Our second case is a little more complicated and they are very different presentations of FHJ. We're gonna call this case Tennis Teen. So I saw Tennis Teen for the first time on August 5th, 2022 for her initial NAPRO visit. So I saw her at the front desk checking in and I knew that the chief complaint was amenorrhea. She had never had a period. So I noticed on her jacket, she had a sports emblem. So right away, I'm thinking she's small, she's thin, she's never had a period, and she's an athlete. So right away, I'm thinking FHA before I even walked into the room. Uh, when I went in, we started the interview. She was a 15-year-old, Ravda Zero, Power Zero. She was there with her mother, but she hadn't had a first period. She had seen an endocrinologist at CHOP, so Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, who tried two progesterone challenges. So sometimes we'll give 10 days of progesterone in order to bring the bleed on for a woman who's not had a period. So she had three progesterone challenges of progestin 10 milligrams, 10 days each time. First day she bled for about two to three days. It was very little bleeding. She only needed a mini pad and she changed it about three times a day. Second challenge was given a few months later. She had some pink red spotting. And then the third challenge, nothing was produced. Now, this tells me she probably doesn't have an outflow tract obstruction, so she did bleed, so that was somewhat reassuring to me. Mom gives a history of premature adrenarchy, so I showed her the Tanner stages. She said at age eight, her daughter was three, nine, she was at stage four, and by 10, she was stage five, so that is something of a premature adrenarchy. She didn't have any breast development, but she had an older sister, eight years older, who also had premature adrenarchy with premature breast development at age eight and had a period by age 11. This patient also had a longstanding history of constipation on and off for many years. Currently, she was having a bowel movement about once a week, and she would use Miralax relatively routinely when she didn't have a bowel movement for two weeks. Mom said she required a special formula when she was a child because she couldn't break down protein, close quote. And also she has since childhood always required a very clean diet, mostly fruits, vegetables, and low processed food. So I'm getting a story here that she's eating very little. I don't think this is constipation per se. I think this is more that she isn't making very much waste to eliminate because the caloric intake is very slow and she turned out that she was an athlete as well. So she was a competitive tennis athlete. She played soccer since age five, switched to tennis at age 12, and she attended a prestigious tennis academy 
when she was in eighth grade from 2020 to 2021. The students played or trained in tennis approximately six to seven hours a day, then had academics four hours a day. So this is high stress for an eighth grader. She's also away from her family in a different state. She lost eight to 10 pounds during this academic year from 116 to 107. When I saw her, her vital signs were 5'1". The weight was 97 pounds. She's in the ninth percentile. Her BMI was 18.3. The only meds she was on was Trentinoin for acne. So I'm wondering about PCOS here. Again, we know the diet. She was playing tennis about 12 hours a week and she competed in tournaments one to twice a month. The scoff um, screening was deferred on the first visit because the first visit was quite lengthy. The review of systems was unremarkable with the exception of some eczema that she had mostly on her hands and the constipation we mentioned. She didn't, the review of systems for endocrinology was completely negative. She didn't pluck, shave, or tweeze any coarse hairs from anywhere in her body. So again, I'm looking there for the PCOS clinical hyperandrogenism. Now, uh, her physical exam was unremarkable again, with the exception of she was 10 or stage three with a few hairs around her areolar for breast development. She was 10 or stage five as expected for pubic development. Otherwise, everything was normal. We deferred the internal exam for the patient and the mom's request. So my favorite diagnosis at the end of the first visit was FHA. I also wondered about a concomitant PCOS or possible non-classic adrenal hyperplasia due to that family history of the premature adrenarchy. I felt somewhat reassured that she had the outflow tract, that she did not have an outflow tract obstruction because of the progesterone challenges that occurred at CHOP. Um, um, my guess thought was that she did not have constipation. This was more likely that her body required most of the body didn't have anything to eliminate because she really wasn't taking in very much food for what she was expending. Uh, um, I offered to reach out to a specialist uh, who in adrenal pathology to see if I could pick their brain to see if there might be some other uh, condition that I wasn't aware of. I provided extensive education via the Queen of Heart website on the FHA page. We talked about lifestyle changes and how effective they can be in bringing on this menstrual cycle. Um, I referred the patient to a dietitian. I referred her to a CBT therapist, but she was not interested in doing that at that time. Um, and we ordered labs and imaging, but obviously I couldn't time them to cycle day three labs and five imaging because she wasn't menstruating. So we just did the labs and the imaging. The follow-up visits look like this. So she, I was seeing her about every two months or so. And you can see if we look down here, she had some weight gain, 97, 99, 101, 116 to 115. That's an okay weight gain. It's not really enough uh, for what we need to turn that cycle back on. Uh, I did do a scoff screen on the first follow-up, which was negative. She had all no responses. I did notice that the labs, her estradiol was undetectable. It gave weight to the FHA and the DHEAS was overtly high, not surprising with that premature adrenarchy. 17 OHP for the non-classic adrenal hyperplasia was pending. Her ovaries, her left ovary was a little bit on the larger side, but not hitting the 10 mils. The right ovary was more normal and the endometrium was thin on ultrasound. So I did get back the 17 OHP, which surprised me. It was totally normal, even on the low side. It was done correctly prior to 8 a.m. Uh, I still wondered if I was missing some type of adrenal pathology. So on follow-up three, she reported that she had had mild pelvic cramps and a little bit of blood on a tissue times two, but didn't even require the mini pad. Um, again, she had gained some weight, but definitely not enough. So we did start to talk about hormone replacement therapy because by follow-up four, we were seven months out from the initial visit. So I talked to mom a little bit about what that would look like and the patient. So these are the labs that were obtained. So anything in red is what's considered to be not exactly normal. So a 45 is really not a low vitamin D, but it's lower than we want it. Again, our goal is between 50 and 75 in NAPRO. You can see her cholesterol was too low. So she did need to bulk this up in order to be able to make her hormones. This is her LDL at 87. That's her total. Her HDL was nice and high where we want it, but we do need to bump this up. 
For glucose and insulin three specimen testing, she was normal on all glucose time intervals. And the only interval that was a little bit high was her one hour insulin. Typically we would like that below 66, she was 90, but this was not enough for me to treat her. You can see her fasting insulin is quite low at 4.3. Um, we just want that below 6.8, and that's a lot lower than mainstream men even feels as abnormal. So she has more of a low insulin than a high insulin, but still a little suspicion of possible PCOS, uh, a concomitant PCOS. So the reproductive labs confirm FHA. Her estradiol was undetectable on the first draw in August. A few months later, a little bit of improvement with the lifestyle changes and just mild improvement again with lifestyle changes. Again, the androgen profile, the DHEAS, was the only one that was overtly high for her because we went by a 10 or stage four. She was a three for breasts and, and a five for pubic area, so I gave her a 10 or stage four. Thyroid profile was optimized for her. I have a little asterisk here because in NAPRO, for fertility reasons, um, just like mainstream medicine fertility, we do prefer that TSH to be 2.5 or under. But for this woman, I'm certainly, or for this young lady, I'm certainly not going to give her some additional thyroid hormones. That's the last thing she needs with FHA. So her pelvic ultrasounds in sequential order here, we have a little bit larger than I would expect for the first ultrasound with a thin endometrium, an even larger ovary now. So I'm wondering, am I awakening this HPO axis and are we going to have a concomitant HPO or a concomitant PCOS? A little bit bigger, but still a thin endometrium. Now we have a thin endometrium. Radiologist reporting on a lot of follicles, but doesn't quite meet the criteria. And we still have a little bit of pushing a large ovary. So I did give her a diagnosis of um, that we're monitoring her for PCOS, mainly because of those high, the early, the premature adrenarche can be a sign of PCOS and her high DHEAS, as well as her irregular cycles. But again, we know FHA is primary driver. She may have concomitant PCOS as we awaken those adrenals. Okay, so this is after pharmacotherapy. I did start her on estrogen and progesterone. And so what we have here is we have now an ovary that meets PCOS criteria, and we have an endometrium that is more normal. This is when she again is receiving estradiol every day and progesterone 10 days a month. So follow-up five or follow-up five and six. I had started with a low patch of 0.25. It didn't wasn't enough to produce a bleed. We went up to 0.05, and that was enough to produce a bleed. The patient is now having monthly withdrawal bleeds with the estradiol building up her endometrium and the progesterone sloughing that off. And, and hence, we are protecting her bones. She's also had more breast development. She's now a stage four, maybe even between a four and five. Uh, I do have a likely PCOS diagnosis going, or I'm thinking about adding it, uh, really due to this high DHEAS. I sent her to a Boston Children's Hospital specialist in FHA to make sure I wasn't missing any concomitant adrenal pathology, um, and the physician did not think I did. Um, she pretty much agreed with the workup that I had done, um, and this patient did have a normal DEXA. MRI is pending. I was really not... Um, feeling like I had to push this patient to get the MRI. I was kind of straddling the middle. Uh, the doctor at Boston Hospital ordered it for her. The patient's very happy with her pseudo periods and her cyclic withdrawal bleeds. She actually feels a little more ready now to maybe go to the next step and gain some weight to have a true period. She's very intelligent. She understands really well what's going on. Um, she does have some reservations in gaining weight because it may impact her tennis game and it also uh, because of the social stigma. Uh, she's a little more open to going to the cognitive therapist now. I think she might have agreed to go to at least one initial visit. So what's next for tennis team? I called her on the phone to let her know that this presentation was going to come out and I asked her if she had anything to say to the audience and she actually wanted to ask me about what were the steps needed to be taken to become a PA. And um, which was super, I guess, made me feel super happy because um, she felt that her NAPRO experience inspired her to perhaps, or at least to consider pursuing an advanced practice provider degree, mainly because she felt that um, she could have a positive impact on others. Um, so I do totally adore tennis team. I continue to see her and I can't wait to see her again for next visit. 
And I know she'll watch this lecture, so I want to thank her very much for letting me present her case. Now we have clinical case two. This is Smarty Pants, very different from case one. So I met Smarty Pants on January 27th, 2023 for her initial NAPRO visit. She had a past medical history of Graves' disease, and she presented to me with five months of secondary amenorrhea. She had been seeing another NAPRO doc for about two and a half years. That NAPRO doc gave her a diagnosis of PCOS due to long cycles and high testosterone per her note. I had her note to review. Now the testosterone um, that was considered high was only 42, and maybe some practitioners feel that above 30 is high for a female, but the norms that are set are 12 to 71. So I probably wouldn't have uh, made that call. In particular, the patient when she was diagnosed was only 17. And per the guidelines, the international guidance for PCOS, we are really not supposed to diagnose a teen with PCOS until she's eight years past menarche. This patient's menarche was age 14. Um, and looking closely at the note, the patient had reported to the former NAPRO physician that her periods would stop completely when she paid, played field hockey in high school and, and out of season they would return. So that was sort of a, a real clincher for this is probably FHA, not PCOS. And by the way, her ovaries were small on ultrasound. They were 3.49 mils and 1.34 mils respectively for right and left ovary. So a patient was being sort of co-managed by the former NAPRO doc and the endocrinologist at CHOP for the hyperthyroidism. She also had been to a functional medicine doctor at one of the Cleveland clinics around the country who was an MD and who told her that the reason for her amenorrhea was mold toxicity and started her on quite a few supplements. So when I was doing the med medication reconciliation, the patient began to cry because she was on so many medications, she couldn't remember who gave her what or what they were for. So my heart broke for her. These are all the medicines that were on her initial visit chart. So the patient had been giving one medication, okay, from the endocrinologist, which obviously was needed methamethyl for her hyperthyroidism. However, all of these other medications seem to be not necessarily needed, at least to me, with the exception of vitamin D. So 15 supplements and she was taking 25 pills daily. I really felt that the overload of supplementation was causing her to be more anxious, more stressed, and really feeding this FHA. So I asked her if I could call the other clinicians and if we could work as a team and if I could ask them if she could come off everything except for vitamin D and calcium to protect her bones and perhaps the daily vitamin she was taking. She agreed to allow me to do that. And what was also quite heart-wrenching is one of her quotes to me was, I've been doing everything everyone tells me and I still have not had a period for 140 days. So she, fortunately she had charted with the Crichton model system with the last NAPRO doc. So I had the advantage of being able to look back at her charts for many, for many months. Uh, we'll start though with her vital signs. So currently she was five foot zero inches and her weight was hundred pounds. So the BMI was low at 19.5. I had noticed on some past records that as recent as 526, her weight was 120. Her diet, I asked her about, she said she eats clean, gluten and dairy free, salads, fruits, chicken, beans, quinoa. She had been asked to do a plant-based diet by the last NAPRO doc, which was obviously very low in caloric intake, feeding this FHA. Her exercise really wasn't excessive. It was Pilates about 30 minutes, four to five times a day, and maybe 20 minute run three times a month. She did play field hockey for four years in high school. And this was occurring all the way back in high school, associated again with the um, sports season. The scoff questionnaire was negative. She had one yes, which was the weight loss of 15 pounds in a three month period. She was a freshman in college. So this is the key. This is this patient's FHA was being driven more by anxiety, perfectionism, higher achieving. She was a freshman in college. She went on a full academic scholarship um, and she was taking three honors courses and a total of 20 credits. So her hyperthyroidism was augmenting the FHA and her perfectionist anxiety and stress personality was the primary driver. Her low caloric intake was also augmenting her FHA. Her many supplements was augmenting her anxiety. 
I asked her about her anxiety and here's her quotes. I know I have anxiety. I can just be in a state of panic and stress when I do my schoolwork. My heart can be racing. My thoughts are intense. She also said, I'm an intense person. That's how other people would describe me and things matter to me. I try to do them well, like my schoolwork. Again, medical history is paramount. And here's your clinical FHA. So here's her charts. So I didn't give you all the charts that she gave me, but to make a point here, she had started charting in 12 of 2021. The NAPRO doc had initially told her to just look for stretchy mucus and was going to forego the charting, but she couldn't identify any peak day. So as you can see, what you're seeing here is the patient's having multiple breakthrough bleeds. These are all light and very light bleeds. These are not periods. Uh, she's having no clear peak days, so she's not ovulating. Um, so this is what her chart looks like. This does look like a PCOS chart. Again, the history is paramount. Now, what happened is she had a period right here on 7-19-22 that was very light, but still looks like a real period because she had some moderate flows in here. And then her next period flow was very light on 9-15. So this was a 57-day cycle. So this is when things changed. And then she had five months of complete amenorrhea. So when I looked at this chart and I compared it to the uh, medical record documents that I had, I noticed that she had a significant weight loss of 20 pounds over two months between May and mid-July, and that coincided with her period completely stopping or her period changing and spanning out and then stopping. So my favorite diagnosis for her at her first visit was functional hypothalamic amenorrhea, again, driven by her anxiety, stress, and perfectionist personality. I requested permission to reach out to the other doctors to work as a team to calm her down and to see if I could get her off all of those supplements. Um, most of the um, providers agreed. Uh, obviously, I didn't want her off the methamazole. I did talk to her endocrinologist though, and I deferred the endocrinology management to her instead of a co-management, which really is better for the specialist to be managing. I also um, spoke to the functional medicine doctor. She was quite convinced that the problem of her amenorrhea was due to mold toxicity, so reluctantly agreed to a trial off of her supplements. The NAPRO doc agreed to a trial off of all of hers, except really wanted her to stay on the naltrexone that she was taking for the antibodies. We had a, the th antibodies against the thyroid. We had a discussion that in hypothyroid, the antibodies we know are going to make them more hypothyroid, or well, at least that's a theory of the high antibodies. And so, but the antibodies that she has for hyperthyroidism we do want them to work on the thyroid gland and we do want her to get into the hypothyroid state sooner versus later because the methamazole is not without problematic side effects. So we want her off the methamazole and on something safer like Synthroid. Um, however, the NAPRO dog preferred her to stay on the low dose naltrexone, so she agreed to do that. Um, I gave her extensive education again for the FHA Queen of Hearts website. I requested the other office visit notes from endocrinology, functional medicine, referred her to a dietitian, cognitive behavioral therapist. I asked her to stop charting Crichton for now because she was just not bleeding. She was just charting dry cycles that was causing her more anxiety. And we went ahead and ordered the labs. Um, I had seen, I had found that her TSH was really low at 0 0.01. She had high free T4, high free T3. And so it was a significant overt, overt hyperthyroidism being well managed by the endocrinologist. Her TSIs, which are thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins, were very high at the outset. And over time, they had become much less, almost to a normal level. Um, her anti TPO antibodies that the NAPRO doc was using the naltrexone for were really only 29, and normal is 26. So the second visit she came back, she actually asked to also go off the naltrexone because she felt so much better being off the supplement. So I agreed to that. These are her initial health labs. So everything in red is what is abnormal. Estradiol was very low, supporting the FHA diagnosis. Um, andro, androgen profile, her testosterone was very normal at 30. Her DHEA is 
S was even though within the normal range, we consider that pretty high for a woman. So I'm going to watch her again for a concomitant PCOS. TSH, it's a little bit hard because again, she's on the methamazole trying to wean her down. TSIs are coming down. As I mentioned, here's the new TSI at 0 0.75. Um, so typically in NAPRO, we like this TSH below, or we like it between 1 and 2.5, but obviously we're not going to give someone with hyperthyroidism, thyroid hormones to bring that down. Um, pelvic uh, ultrasound, uh, this was mine. I couldn't really verify the day, but again, a little bit of a large ovary on the right side, thin endometrium going with FHA. So here's the follow-up visits. I'm gonna go right down to here to follow up three. This woman gained 40 pounds by the time I saw her for the third time. So she went hard with these lifestyle changes. She wanted her period back. And I was amazed and extremely impressed with this young woman's um, um, effort and, and how she, well she listened and her humility and just how she was able to bring back her cycle. Uh, she went to cognitive behavioral therapy. She was one of the patients that gave me the feedback that Joni was amazing and exceptionally helpful. She is actually having true periods, which are coming on a monthly cycle now. This is her chart. So when she first started to have the periods back, when she had gained, I think when she hit closer to between 120 and 130, then by the time she was up at 140, she looked like this. And we were now seeing a buildup of peak days. So she's having a follicle buildup. She has reset her HPO axis. Uh, she is ovulating. We can see peak days are here in peas. However, she has these very short post-peak phases. And she recognized that because she was knowledgeable with the Crichton model system. So what I did is I would give her 200 milligrams of progesterone, but she would bleed right away. So at this cycle, I decided to give her 200 milligrams of progesterone and test the levels the next day. And then we uptighted, traded her to 400. Giving her 400 allowed her to increase this post-peak phase. And now she's having adequate post-peak phases. And we've had adequate P7 levels of progesterone. So she's seeing me about every three months. She's on minimal supplements, which is only 2,000 vitamin D. Her last level was 55. Calcium 600 twice a day, magnesium and melatonin to help her sleep at night because she still has that insomnia from her hyperthyroidism. She works with a dietitian. I told her it's okay now to start to lose a pound or two about every month. Uh, she loves the cognitive behavior therapist and she dropped her honors classes. So I did call her too to ask her if she had anything to say to the audience and to thank her for letting me share her case. And here's her adorable quotes. I felt good that my period is back from a societal standpoint of, or from a societal point of view, people don't understand the weight. I would encourage women who have not done this to not be afraid. It was a sacrifice and a true marker of a woman's health is her cycle, not her BMI. Now, this, these are her exact quotes. And again, they are just super adorable. So any questions? Here's my references. Uh, feel free to reach out to me by email. Please check out my Queen of Hearts um, Fertility website. It's queenofheartsfertility.org uh, for lots of great information about how to treat with NAPRO. And um, thank you so much for your time.